Hey, welcome back everyone to the world according to Briggs. This is another one of our extended video compilation type things where we take a series of videos and we put them all together like a one video playlist for you. Two years ago, we did a series of videos where we first asked a question, what state would you never move to and why? And also, if you're living in one of these states, why do you want to leave? So we put this question out to people. 10 states came up more than any others. So we made these 10 videos where we listed the reasons people say they would never live there or why they want to get out. This is the results of those videos. We're going to start off with the great state of Washington. This one is a little strange because Washington's a very move to state. People really like living there. Seattle's got its problem, but pretty much the rest of the state's in good shape. So this one was kind of strange. Let's take a look at Washington. Let's take a look at Washington State and the reasons locals say not to move there. Washington State is in the Pacific Northwest along with Oregon and Idaho. Did you know that? Did you know Idaho was part of the Pacific Northwest? I was surprised when I learned that too, and I'm sure it irritates most Idaho residents to no end, knowing that they share anything with Oregon besides a border. Anyway, most surveys rank Washington State as one of the best states to live in in the United States, with many of those in recent years having them at the number one spot. Today we'll look at why Washington isn't for everyone though. Every place on the planet has its good and its bad. There is no paradise, there is no fantasy island, some people are gonna like it, some people ain't. This video's not made to tell people not to move to the Evergreen State. We are just looking at some problems they have that you should probably know before you start looking for a house and calling realtors. Some things on here you might find appealing, but to most people, they aren't. Got it? Get it? Good. Let's take a look. Number 10, the high cost of living. The cost of living in Washington state is higher than the national average. In 2022, the cost of living index for Washington state was 123.1. The easiest way to look at that index is like this. If you take the average state, which in 2022 was Minnesota, and if you were to purchase anything for $100, let's say it's Pop Rocks and Soda. In Minnesota, that costs you $100. In Washington, it cost $123.10. Just enough to kill the average person. If you're too young and you don't get that reference, ask your parents, or I'll tell you. Back in the 80s, there was an urban legend that if you ate Pop Rocks and drank soda at the same time, your stomach would explode and you'd die there on the playground. I tried that after my first girlfriend broke up with me. It just gave me gas. But yeah, everything's expensive in Washington state, not just Pop Rocks and soda. It's not the most expensive state in the union, but it's up there. Number nine, terrible traffic. Now, obviously this is just gonna be the Seattle area where most of the people live, so it makes sense this is on people's minds. From Olympia to Tacoma to Seattle to Everett, you're gonna run into some traffic that whole area. It's pretty rough. Sure, if you head out east to the Washington Outback, you're not gonna see much traffic, but yeah, that whole Seattle area, the metro area, it's a nightmare. What's strange about it is during the winter months, it's not as bad as it is during the summer months. Because during the summer months, that's when they start doing road work. Because the weather's good. That just slows down the traffic and makes it harder. I mean, outside that area, it's a great place to drive around. I mean, the state is freaking beautiful. It's a great state for a road trip. Well, that is until you get to the Seattle area, then you start to cry a little bit. I'll give you an idea how bad it is in the Seattle metro area. The average commute time in the United States is 17.2 minutes. In the Seattle metro area, it's 26.4 minutes. Number eight, weather and climate. Yes, this is a big complaint for a lot of people living in the Seattle metro area. I think people that live there forever are used to it and they kind of live with it and they understand it. But if you're new to the area, let's say you've only lived there a handful of years, it'll wear on you. Washington has long, dark winters. The days are short and the weather can be, you know, cold and dreary. One of the biggest complaints about people new to Seattle, it doesn't seem like they get enough sun every day. I thought that was interesting, so I did a little bit of research on that, didn't get too far into it, but I found different things about how because of cloud cover, some people consider they didn't get enough daylight, but that's really not accurate, didn't get enough sunlight. Sun's still there, it's just behind the clouds, but then of course, the further you go from the equator, the less daylight you'll get, and Seattle's pretty high up there, the entire state of Washington is. Not by a whole bunch, it's not like you're moving to Nome, Alaska, where a one night stand can last 30 days, but enough to notice. Seattle also gets a ton of rain, 
especially in the western part of the state. The average annual rainfall in Seattle is a little over 39 inches. Now, obviously, snowfall varies throughout the state. You go up to the mountains, it's going to be a lot. You go down to the lower parts, the eastern part, not as much. But let's take Seattle, where most of the people live and most people move to. They get less than 10 inches a year, normally. Now, they have had some years where it's gone way over that, but that's usually what they get around that. Number seven, high crime. The crime rate in Washington state is higher than a lot of other states. In 2020, the violent crime rate in Washington state was 3.6 for every 1,000 residents. That's just the violent crime. And that's higher than the national average, which at the same time was 3.1. Still nothing compared to Detroit, where it's like 10.2 for every 1,000 residents, and I think Memphis is around 12.8. So it's not bad, but people do complain about it. Obviously, you're going to have a lot of crime in the Seattle area because it's a city. Cities have more crime than rural areas because more people means more problems. But it's not just Seattle. If you go out to the eastern side of the state, you got Spokane, and they've got a whole bunch of crime problems. Number six, lack of diversity. Yes, this is a complaint by some people, and I hate bringing it up because we're just going to get a whole bunch of people in the comment section that need to say things like diversity is a bad thing. Not saying it's 100% good, but I think diversity makes the world a lot more interesting and better. But Washington really doesn't have much of it. About 70% of Washington's population is white. 13.7% is Hispanic. About 11% is Asian. African American is about 5.3. Native Americans about 3.2. And Pacific Islanders has 1.4. Number five, natural disasters. Now, this one's a little weird because the ones that everyone's afraid of don't happen that often, hardly at all. Washington state is prone to natural disasters such as earthquakes, volcanoes, and floods. Floods you're going to get every single winter. That happens. Earthquakes every so often, and the last time they had a significant volcano blow up was 1980. So quit worrying about it. Sure, Mount St. Helens blew up. That was amazingly devastating to the area, but it happened in 1980, okay? Quit worrying about it. If you are worried about it, don't live at the top of a mountain. That happens to have smoke billowing out of the earth. Number four, lack of jobs. Now, Washington state does have a lot of jobs. The problem is they got a lot of people trying to get those jobs. And we're talking about the high paying ones, usually in the tech industry, things like that, aerospace, whatever. They have a lot of those jobs, but they just have even more qualified candidates. A lot of people that were just working normal tech jobs have kind of shifted their focus to healthcare technology because that seems to be a little bit better way to get a job and still working in tech. Healthcare always has jobs. But that's the biggest problem people say working and living in, especially the Seattle area. There's just too much competition for the good paying jobs. Number three, the residents are unfriendly. Yeah, you know, I could see this one, especially when you take Seattle into consideration. Seattle has this thing up there they call the Seattle Freeze, where if you're new to the area, it's really hard to make friends. So in the cities especially, there's this lack of welcoming atmosphere. And if you move there, it takes a long time to start feeling like you belong, I guess. Washington, and again, especially in the Seattle area, it's also known for being one of the worst places to be single and in the dating scene. Number two, the homelessness. Yes, the homelessness. You knew we'd be getting to this eventually. Everybody knows Seattle, especially, has a pretty bad homeless situation. Any city in Washington has a fair amount of homeless. Same thing going on down here in Portland and Los Angeles. The West Coast is just silly with homeless people. Now, not wishing any ill will on them, but these people are in a bad situation. They just drain the resources of a community and they bring other problems like real estate prices going down, which you'll find to number one. Seattle could use some of that. Crime gets spiked in areas where there's a lot of homeless people. They have to put money in addiction services, housing services, and mental health services. Costs money, and it hurts the community. I'm not talking bad about these people. I am just stating a fact, a statistical fact that they drain communities and they need help. But it is a problem, and it's something people take into consideration when they're moving there or when they're living there. Myself, I go up to Seattle a few times a year, a handful of times a year. There's a company up there I do voiceover work with, one of the only ones that doesn't let me do it from home, which kind of sucks, but they pay good. Every time I've gone up there, I've been up there two or three days. I don't see as many homeless as I have in Portland. 
in Seattle, if you don't see them, they're staying underneath the overpasses. We don't have much of that here in Portland. I mean, they do, but they also camp out on the streets a lot. More than I'd say I've seen in Seattle. Now, I haven't scoured the entire city. This is just my observation. I'm sure that's going to lead to someone leaving comments. I'm sure a few people about how bad it is. They'll tell me where they all are and all that. Great. All right, before we get to number one, don't forget we have another channel called On This Day. There is a link for that in the description area below. All right, on to number one. And number one, the real estate is insane. Yes, insane is a perfect way to explain how bad the real estate market is in all the cities of Washington. Sure, even the rural communities are pretty expensive compared to other states, but you run into the ridiculousness when you start getting in the cities, especially Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia, even down in Vancouver, Washington. It's nuts. The median home price in Washington state is $668,000. That's the median. That's number three. California has $843,000 and Hawaii is $715,000. Obviously, Part of the reason it's so high is the Seattle metro area. It's insane there. In recent months, I've been looking at homes in Washington, for the most part in the southern section near Ridgefield and Vancouver, Washington. Want to take advantage of that no state income tax they got going on over there. Besides having high real estate prices, they have a real problem with affordable housing, meaning their rents are high and they don't have many homes that are on the cheap side. So if you want to live, let's say, in the Seattle metro area, you better make a lot of money or you better have a lot of roommates. Hopefully you don't have one of those roommates that eats your cereal and then replaces it with like the generic brand. You know, you had Cocoa Pebbles and now you have a Cocoa Pebbles box filled with Dino Bites from the dollar store or something. I've had a roommate that did things like that. He was a big dude. He used to dump a whole thing of Oreos and milk and eat it like cereal. I used to watch that guy eat and I realized I'm staring at him like I'm watching an animal documentary on Animal Planet or something. Anyway, housing is expensive for everyone in Washington, not just dudes that eat cookies like their cereal. All right, next up we have everybody's punchline, Arkansas. Arkansas is one of those states that everyone's got a joke about. They've died down a little bit, but back in the day, everyone had a joke that had something to do with Arkansas and dating a close relative. Really strange. Those jokes have kind of died out over the years, but they're still pretty funny. Let's take a look at why people don't want to move to or don't want to live in Arkansas. Today, I'm going to tell you why Arkansas has a growth chart that looks like a scary roller coaster. That's right. Today, we're looking at the state that has more jokes told about it than any other state. If you're a baby boomer or a Gen Xer, chances are you've heard a few jokes over the years that had to do with Arkansas and probably getting hitched to a close relative. Jeff Foxworthy made a career about making redneck jokes. He's from central Georgia, but every single joke he told could be said about Arkansas just as easily. Its nickname is the natural state, and it has a very strange growth chart in the early 1800s, it saw triple digit growth, and then it dropped down to double digit for a few decades. Then they had a few decades where they were in the negative, then they went up to single, then to double digits for a couple decades. And in the last decade, they saw 3.3% growth thanks to a high birth rate and a relatively low death rate. Things are slowing down in Arkansas again, and it's predicted that they will lose around 5% of their population by 2030 just because people aren't moving to Arkansas anymore. So why is this? Today, I'm gonna to give you the results of a survey where they asked people that were getting ready to move had they considered Arkansas. And if they said no, they had a few things they could choose from as to the reason why. In these videos, some of the reasons are the same as other states, but the stats are always different. They also asked the people that lived in Arkansas if they would ever recommend moving to Arkansas to a family member. 62% of the people in Arkansas said no. Got it, get it, good. Let's take a look. Number 10, the weather is hot and humid in the summer. The average temperature in July is about 92 degrees Fahrenheit and the humidity can be oppressive. If you've ever spent a summer in the South, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And the whole area has that swamp smell to it too. Now, the winters can be cold and in some areas it can be very snowy. The average low temperature in January is about 32 degrees Fahrenheit and there can be a lot of snow that follows that. Now, I bring up the fact that they have snow because for some reason, people seem to think that the southern states don't get any snow. That's wrong. They do get snow. Do they get Minnesota, Wisconsin snow in January? No, but they do get cold and they do see some snow. 
Number nine, it's too rural. Yes, this is a big complaint for people. They think it's too rural. I mean, it kind of plays into their whole natural state. It is kind of rural. Their cities aren't terribly big. The most populous city in Arkansas is Little Rock, the state capital, and they only have about 204,000 residents. Now, that's just the city itself. The whole metro area has less than a million, 748,000. Arkansas is filled to the brim with little small rural towns. And when I say nice small rural towns, I hope you don't get the image of New England small town or anything like that. They do have some nice small towns, but a majority of them are the type of place where you get off the interstate, get a glimpse of the town, and the first thing out of your mouth is, keep driving, I can hold it. Arkansas only has a population of about 3 million residents. Most of them live in small towns or rural areas areas. Number eight, the poverty. Yep, a lot of people don't want to move here because this state has legendary poverty levels. Right now, they're doing better, if you want to call it better. Give an example. In 2020, at one point, their poverty level was 18.6%, meaning almost one in five people in Arkansas were living below the poverty line. Now, they've gotten better. In 2022, they got all the way down to about 15%. At that time, the national average was about 11%. Arkansas also has a really low median Median household income. In 2021, the median household income in Arkansas was $47,260. The national average at that time was right around $63,000. Number seven, the crime rate. The crime rate in Arkansas is nuts. Really, it's their violent crime rate is kind of crazy. Nobody really has much to steal, so there's not a lot of property crime. In 2022, the violent crime rate in Arkansas was 4.2 for every 1,000 residents, meaning four people basically are going to have some sort of violent encounter every single year out of 1,000. Now, property crime has done 100,000, but the property crime rate was 2,211 for every 100,000 residents. Two of their most notorious cities for crime are Little Rock and Pine Bluff. Let me give you the stats on that. In Little Rock, the crime rate is 217% above the national average. Their violent crime rate is 432% above the national average. Pine Bluff is worse, believe it or not. Can you get worse? Yes, you can. Pine Bluff, their total crime rate is 238% above the national average, while their violent crime rate is just a hair over Little Rock's 433% above the national average. Go Pine Bluff. And crime always keeps people away. Now, obviously, to be fair, a lot of their smaller towns aren't going to have crazy crime rates like Pine Bluff and Little Rock, but still, on average, there's a little bit higher than other states. Number six, education. Yeah, the education system ain't great in Arkansas. The state has a really low high school graduation rate in 2020. It was 82.7%. Now, that's not the worst. The absolute worst is Arizona with 74% graduation rate. Most of the country is in the low 90s. On top of that, only about 25.5% of Arkansas has bachelor's degree. And overall, their public education system is ranked 48th in the country. Number five, healthcare ranking. Arkansas doesn't have the best healthcare system. I, I mean, I'm sure it's fine, but most of the time in cases like this, it's accessibility. How many hospitals do they have? How many clinics do they have? How many doctors and nurses do they have? Usually that is where the problem is. Arkansas ranks 47th in the country for healthcare. That's not great, especially if you're, you know, of a certain age. If you get up into your 50s, you're Start looking at things like that. When you're 20, 30, I understand you don't care if they got doctors at all because you're invincible. Wait till you hit about 47. Number four, you're going to die sooner than later. Yeah, Arkansas, they have a really low life expectancy. In 2020, the life expectancy in Arkansas was 73.2 years, which was lower than the national life expectancy of 78.2. You're losing five years just by moving to Arkansas. All the New England states are 79 years, 79.1, 79.2. The highest in the country is Hawaii with 80.7. The leading causes of death in Arkansas Heart disease takes 22.3% of the people. Cancer takes 20.8%. And one guy died from having his cheeks super glued together. I guess he went into a panic and uh, had a heart attack of some sort. 
Number three, politics. Now, this one always shows up on these lists. People have a problem with the politics, whatever state it is. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with anyone's politics. It just, some people, it bugs them. I don't get it, but is what it is. So here's the rundown on politics in Arkansas. The state is politically conservative. Arkansas is a very conservative state, and its politics are often dominated by social and religious conservatism. This can be a turnoff for people on the more liberal or progressive side of the political spectrum. So much so that it was voted number three for why people won't move to Arkansas. Number two, travel. This is a weird one. So it's hard to travel to Arkansas. Arkansas is not a major transportation hub. Arkansas doesn't have any major international airports, and it's not a major stop on any major interstate highway. This can make it difficult and expensive to travel to and from Arkansas. If you don't travel a lot, there's parts of the country that are just too far away from any of the big cities. Get too comfortably, I guess you could say. Not comfortably, within reason. Like if you want to fly to, I go to Honesdale all the time. I have to leave Portland and land in some place like North Carolina and then come back to Scranton and then I still got an hour's drive. If I landed in Philadelphia, I got a two hour drive. Up here in Portland, Oregon, if you wanted to go to Bend, you got to fly into Portland, Oregon and take like a three hour drive down to Bend. Well, the entire state of Arkansas is kind of like that. I mean, Little Rock has an airport. It's just not one of the major ones. So not a lot of flights come through there. If you're going to fly there, a lot of times it's like you got to fly to Atlanta. Then you got to come back to Arkansas. Or in some cases, you got to fly to Chicago, then to Atlanta, then back to Arkansas. Or you got to go to Salt Lake City, then to Dallas, then to Arkansas. If you're someone that travels for work, this is a big turnoff, and I could see why it would make it on the list. I don't think it belongs at number two, but apparently this is such a problem in Arkansas that it makes it number two on a list like this. All right, before we get to number one, don't forget we have another channel called On This Day. There's a link for that channel down below in the description area. Please go over and subscribe. All right, on to number one. And number one, teen pregnancy. Yes, this is a problem, especially if you're a parent. Arkansas has a high rate of teen pregnancy. In 2020, the teen pregnancy rate in Arkansas was 14.5 for every 1,000 women aged 15 to 19, which was higher than the national average of 10.8 for every 1,000 women. This can definitely be a concern for parents who are considering moving to Arkansas with young girls or young boys. Someone's got to get them pregnant, right? I have a friend that actually moved her kids from from Tennessee because she had three daughters. She has three daughters and where they're from in Tennessee, that's kind of the trend. It's what happens. She's all, I don't want my girls around that because if your friends are kind of doing things like that, sometimes you slip into that mode too. We always hope our kids go to school and fit in, you know? Sometimes they fit into the wrong things too, not just the good things. All right, up next, we have the show me state. That's right, Missouri. Missouri is a state that we never really talk about it. it never seems to show up on our videos. I mean, maybe some of the cities in there, but for the most part, Missouri kind of flies under the radar. It's always right in the middle of everything. Nothing too terrible, nothing too great. Sort of like Kentucky. Let's take a look at Missouri. Today, I'm going to tell you why people won't move to Missouri. Missouri is in the middle of the country and is considered a flyover state. It is home to the Mark Twain National Forest, the Lake of the Ozarks, and a few great universities. Park University in Parkville, Missouri, and it's one a lot of people don't know about, but hands down, the fastest thinking human being I have ever known went there. Side note, he was a second lieutenant and retired a two-star general a few years back. At least that's what I heard. The Show Me State hasn't had any rapid growth in a very long time. In most decades, they see around 5% growth. The last time Missouri saw double digit growth was in the 1900 census. In the 2020 census, they had the lowest growth in the history of the state, 2.8%. When you dig a little deeper into those numbers, you realize if it wasn't for a higher than average birth rate in the second half of that census, they might have slipped into the negative column. The problem is nobody wants to move to Missouri and it shows their migration numbers. In a survey, Missouri residents were asked if they would recommend the state to friends or family. 59% said no. In this video, we're gonna look at why people say they won't move there or they wanna move out. Got it, get it, good. Let's take a look. 
Number 10, unpredictable weather. Missouri has a humid continental climate, which means that the weather can change quickly and drastically. In the winter, the temperature can drop below freezing, and in the summer, they could reach 100 degrees and stay there for a while. This can be difficult for someone that's coming from a place that has a more consistent weather pattern, like San Diego, where it's pleasant 11 months out of the year and one month of extreme heat. Number nine, they're prone to natural disasters. Missouri is located in the Midwest, which is a region that is prone to natural disasters like floods, blizzards, and tornadoes. In 2011, a series of tornadoes devastated the state, killing 158 people and injuring about 1,100 more. So, real disasters. Not like a burrito before a first date. That's a disaster, but not like these. Number eight, high crime rate. Missouri has an incredibly high crime rate, thanks to its big cities. You got Kansas City and you got St. Louis and Springfield ain't no peach either. People know this and it's one of the main reasons they stay away from the state. In 2022, the violent crime rate in Missouri was 4.6 per every 1,000 residents. Now that's compared to the national average of 3.3 for every 1,000 residents. The property crime in Missouri is 2,485 for every 100,000 residents compared to the national average of 2,010 for every 100,000 residents. Now, to be fair, in recent years, St. Louis's crime rate has been sliding down. It's getting better, a little bit better, not much, but it is getting better. Now, East St. Louis, right over the river in Illinois, is a different story. Even though it's another city in another state, they're right up against each other, a river separates them, you still get a little of the reputation and crime from East St. Louis. Number seven, low wages. Missouri has a lot of jobs and a lot of open jobs. They just don't have a lot of money to go with those jobs. Luckily, the cost of living is kind of low here, but when you're looking to move to a place or be transferred from work or take a new job at a new place, chances are if you're moving to Missouri from someplace, I don't know, on the east or west coast, they're going to lower your wages. Even though the real estate and the cost of living might be lower, a lot of people can't get over that hump to think that I used to make 60 grand a year to do this job in Virginia. Now I got to move to Missouri and get paid 48,000. The median household income in Missouri is about $51,000, which is lower than the national average of $67,000. That's household, not individual. This means that people in Missouri struggle to make ends meet. Not as bad as, let's say, Mississippi and Arkansas, but they struggle. Number six, high poverty rate. Now to piggyback off our low income, we have poverty. Throughout the state, the poverty rate is higher than the national average in Missouri, but in the cities, it kind of blows up. The United States poverty rate right now is 11.2%. The entire state of Missouri, it's 13.2%. But when you get into the cities like St. Louis, St. Louis is about 21% of their population lives below the poverty line. In Kansas City, it's about 15.6%. A majority of the people thinking about moving to Missouri will be moving to a city, so that becomes an issue. Is it the worst in the nation? Absolutely not. Is it something that bothers people? Yes, it does. Number five, low education level. The high school graduation rate in Missouri is 84.3%, which is lower than the national average of 87.9%. This means there's a whole bunch of people floating around Missouri with no high school diploma. Not like high school diplomas are the end all be all, but it's really something nice to have. Especially when employers are looking to move big, let's say, chip factories to your state. They look at things like that. How many people have college degrees? How many people graduated high school? Because they're gonna need an educated workforce. And when you don't see the right numbers, you start looking at places like Ohio and then, then Minnesota. Then eventually you end up opening up your chip factory in Wisconsin. There's a couple things that I think they know. I'm sure they know. Politicians know these things. People that run states, people that run cities, they know these things have to be tackled, but they still don't because it costs money and there's no immediate payoff for it. But the more educated your populace is, you're going to have a lower crime rate. You're going to have a lower homeless rate. You're going to have more people correct people when they use the wrong there. Why do we have three theirs? We should just have one, like aloha. It means hello and goodbye. Or like orange, it's a fruit and it's a color. Or ham sandwich, it's something that's delicious and it's also a great punchline to a really dirty joke. Leave it to me, everyone. I'm gonna fix the education system in the United States. With my skill and know-how, I'm sure we'll all look like idiots in like three or four years. 
Number four, healthcare. Yeah, the healthcare system in Missouri isn't great. U.S. News ranks them 42nd in the nation. In case you're confused, that's out of 50. And it's really not the doctors or the nurses or anything like that. It's just the state has a relatively low number of hospitals, so a lot of people just kind of pass on going to the doctor when they really should. Nothing like a 10-hour ER wait to convince you to maybe just stay home and see how things play out. I mean, who hasn't been hit in the head with a crane hook? Got dizzy, blurred vision, forgot the 8th grade, and then started to vomit. It always seemed to work out for me. Number three, tax burden. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to sit everyone down that's answered this survey and explain to you the taxes aren't that bad in Missouri. But they complained about it in the survey, said that the taxes were too high in Missouri. These people need to get out and explore the rest of the country. With overall tax burden, Missouri is ranked 39th in the nation. I did see another report that said they're ranked 42nd, but it's somewhere in there. Definitely not in the top 10. And these people said the taxes were too high in Missouri. Don't move to New Jersey or California. You'll cry yourself to sleep when you realize you're a horrible decision maker. If you look at WalletHub, WalletHub ranks Missouri as 42nd. With the overall tax tax burden of 7.11%. New York is close to doubling that with 12.47%. They got Hawaii at number two with 12.31%. So whoever answered that survey and said the taxes are rough in Missouri, you need to talk to a tax professional. Number two political climate. Yeah, this is something people complain about more and more. I've been doing these videos for like five or six years and I see complaints in my comment section. I get emails of people suggesting videos I should do and more and more it's starting to be political stuff. Occasionally I'll jump in and do a political type video, but I try and stay away from it. Well, a lot of people don't want to move to Missouri because of it and I guess they're trying to stay away from politics too. Whether it's just politics in general or the fact that Missouri is a very conservative state. Like I always tell people, move wherever you want. They don't force you to start voting Republican or Democrat. That's a beauty of this country. Vote however you want. And truth be told, we need at least two parties. If we all started voting the same, I'm sure things would get so much worse. There's a balance in everything, a yin and a yang. And number one, low quality of life. Missouri has a low quality of life score. It's actually well below the national average, no matter who's doing the survey. There's different organizations that do quality of life scores and what they add to it. Missouri's always towards the bottom of the barrel. This course is due to a number of factors, including the state's high crime rate, the low median household income, and the low education attainment levels. I think the weather plays a big part in the quality of life, and Missouri's got some pretty crazy weather, like we talked about earlier. They usually don't add that into the quality of life score but I think it definitely affects the quality of life in any place you move to. All right, now we go to the Pelican State, the place that holds the great city of New Orleans. It's not that great, but it's pretty interesting. Louisiana. Louisiana's up to bat next. Let's take a look. Louisiana has been an albatross around the neck of the United States forever. Its stats and reputation are better than Mississippi, but not by much. After New Orleans, really, what does this state have? Voodoo? They call it the sportsman's paradise, which is true to a degree. If you're big into fishing and hunting, absolutely. After that, what do they have? Whittling and avoiding the dentist? Since the 1990 census, the growth of Louisiana has gone down to single digit percentage points. Prior to that, they had many years where they were 50, 60, 70% growth. And all of a sudden they dropped down to six, five, seven, and it looks like it's gonna go lower. So why is that? Why aren't people moving to Louisiana anymore? The inward migration has slowed considerably since the 1980s. In a survey, we asked people in the process of moving to another state if they had ever considered Louisiana. If they said no, we asked them a follow-up question and gave them 32 reasons to choose from. And that's what today's video is about. Got it? Get it? Good. Let's take a look. Number 10, natural disasters. This one came up a lot. Louisiana is one of the most disaster prone states in the country, and it's been hit hard by hurricanes, floods, and other natural disasters in recent years. In the summer of 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. That city still hasn't recovered. And it laid waste to good portions of the state. It wasn't just New Orleans. The Six Flags Park they had in New Orleans still sits vacant to this day. The rides are still there, just no people. 
But with the hurricanes and the tropical storms, there is always flooding in Louisiana. Rivers rise, people lose homes, crops get destroyed. It's nasty. But their disasters have caused widespread damage and displacement. They've made people less likely to want to live in Louisiana. The weather plays a big part in that too. Louisiana has a humid subtropical climate like the rest of the South, so it's going to be hot and humid and you're going to have a lot of bugs. Here's a little tip. Whenever you see a place has really hot, humid summers, they're going to have lower than average real estate prices, unless they're right on the coast. Louisiana's a perfect example. Number nine, the economy sucks. The Pelican State has a weak economy and has been struggling to attract new businesses and jobs since forever. This has made it difficult for people to find good paying jobs and scratch out a living in Louisiana without having to go down the bayou and, you know, fish for your dinner. Sure, that sounds like fun until you have to fish for your dinner. But when people can't find decent jobs, they go other places looking for a way to make a living. Economic problems always lead to a higher poverty rate, and Louisiana definitely has a higher poverty rate. In 2022, the poverty rate in Louisiana was about 19.6%. Same time, the national average was like 11%. I say like 11% because it changes just about every month. Louisiana stayed solid at about 19.5, 19.6. Number eight, quality of life. A lot of people picked quality of life. Now, quality of life has a lot of different stats that go into it, and some of them you'll see later on in this list. But the definition of quality of life is the standard of health, comfort, and happiness experienced by an individual or group. So it's basically a combination of all the stats where they put them together and they figure out what your chances of living a happy, healthy life are in whatever area. And in Louisiana, <laughs> it's not good. Interesting fact about that, there was a documentary called Happy some years back. It was like 2012. Anyway, they went around and they basically researched how to be happy and who's happy and what makes people happy. Oddly enough, Cajun people in Louisiana were the happiest people in the United States. And it had nothing to do with the money because they didn't have a lot. It had to do with how close-knit their family and friends were. Now that goes against what I'm saying in this video, but I just thought that was interesting. Overall, most people think that the quality of life in Louisiana sucks, unless you're Cajun, I guess. Number seven, education. Louisiana seems to be the place where reading and writing go to die. According to different studies and area vibes, which gives them an F, Louisiana has some of the worst public schools in the country. This makes it difficult for children to get a good education, obviously, and it can discourage families from moving to the state because of it. One of the reasons I left California is because my kids were getting a horrible education at their high school. It was overcrowded, understaffed, and under budgeted. When I moved up here to Oregon, my oldest was a freshman in high school. I knew the schools weren't great in my area, which was a upper middle class neighborhood. But until he got to the high school, yeah, that was it for me. That plays a big part of decision making for state to state migration for families. Number six, crime. I'm surprised crime didn't show up later on in this list, like number one or two, because Louisiana's got some serious crime. New Orleans has really bad crime. Shreveport has really bad crime. And Baton Rouge, the state capital, is one of the most dangerous cities in the United States. The violent crime rate in Baton Rouge is 222% above the national average. Their overall crime rate is 139% above the national average, meaning you have a 1 in 18 chance of being the victim of a crime every single year. Number five, the infrastructure sucks. Yeah, it kind of does. Let's just start with the basics. The roads in New Orleans and in Baton Rouge and pretty much everywhere else in the state, budget and weather are the enemy of the roads in Louisiana. I was just in New Orleans back in January. And if you just look down at the ground, you would think you're in a third world country. That's how bad the roads were. The bridges and they got limited public transportation. Now, my structure also plays into how many schools, how many hospitals do they have? Things like that. They don't have a lot of either. But it is definitely hard to get around in all the major cities of Louisiana. It's all because of infrastructure. 
Number four, healthcare. Yes, this is a concern for a lot of people. On most of these videos, healthcare always seems to pop up. Louisiana has some of the worst healthcare in the country. This can make it difficult for people to get the care they need and can cause people to leave the state or not move there in retirement. Especially, that's a big thing. If you're a retiree, one of the first things you're going to look at is cost of living, cost of housing, and then how's the healthcare? Because it is cheap. And if you're retired, cheap is like the top of your list, but the healthcare in this state is so bad, a lot of them avoid it just because of that. Now, again, like I always say, it's not the doctors, it's not the nurses, it's just the lack of hospitals and lack of funding. Sure, you have private hospitals and stuff like that, but those are few and far between also. Number three, amenities. Yes, people say they don't have enough to do in Louisiana. Now, you have New Orleans, absolutely. But like I said at the beginning of this video, after that, what do you got? There's a lot of things going on in New Orleans, but I mean, that's, that is it. I'm sure if you live there, you know of some festivals and you know of some hiking places or some camping places, things like that, but nothing jumps out at you like their closed Six Flags. If that was still open, that might be legit. They have the Mississippi River running through there, and I'm sure a lot of fun things happen on that, but... Now, I promise you I'm going to get a lot of grief in the comment section for this one. Now, I didn't choose this. This was from a survey, but I kind of agree with it. From an outsider's point of view, there's not a lot past New Orleans to do in Louisiana. Now, I purposely didn't research and see if there's anything I'm missing because that's kind of my point. It's the perception of what's going on there. If there's a whole bunch of things that people don't know about, then that's on the state of Louisiana for not doing enough advertising for their tourism. Number two, the politics. The politics of Louisiana are legendary. There's different organizations that make these lists, and I've done a couple of these videos, but almost every single one of them says Louisiana has a history and is probably the most corrupt political system of any of the states, Illinois being like a close second. A lot of people pick this one because they don't like the political friction that goes on in a lot of conservative states. People have a bad taste in their mouth for that stuff these days. Now, obviously, if you're a liberal, you probably won't want to move to a state that's kind Kind of overflowing with the conservatism. Now, that's how people are. I don't care. I'll move wherever. I think in my last video, I said, you don't, don't move someplace and they don't force you to be a conservative or they don't force you to be a liberal. But that plays a big part these days, whether someone will move someplace or not. I think it's a little silly. Move wherever you want. All right, before we get to number one, if you're thinking about moving to Louisiana or any state, there is a link in the description area for Home and Money. It's a great website that'll help you get in touch with a local realtor for wherever you're moving to. All right, on to number one. And number one. The culture. Louisiana has a unique culture, but it can be different from what people are used to, and it really is. This makes it difficult for people to adjust to life in the state, and it can also lead to people moving away, which has been a problem. The culture in Louisiana is probably one of the strangest in the United States. It's very different. Not saying it's bad. It is very different. I mean, from their accent to the little words they use that nobody else uses, to the food, to their love of music, which is wonderful, don't get me wrong. Wrong. When there's good music, so this is something I noticed. When there's good music playing, it kind of, you know, goes before everything else. You may be on your way to work or whatever, but if someone's playing music on the corner, you might stop and listen for a few minutes, even if you're running late, because it kind of, it's it's hard to explain, but I'm trying. That's just their thing. It's strange. Now, I've been to other parts of Louisiana, not just New Orleans. Sort of reminds me of where I grew up. If there's good surf, all plans kind of go out the window for a lot of people that live there. They call it a good swell. If there's a good swell, then yeah, you probably had to go to school and do a final, but there's a good swell and it's, it's really strange life. I mean, other places in the United States have little weird things like that. New Orleans, it's their music. I mean, these people have a whole band that follows you down the road for a funeral. It's not just a band. It's like a walking party with live music and one dead person. All right, now we have New Mexico. You know that desert state where the aliens supposedly crashed in the 1940s? Yeah, New Mexico. That's where the whole Roswell thing happened. And ever since then, people have been abducted by aliens. And for some reason, they always seem to send a probe up them. Don't know what that's all about. There's an interesting story about aliens. If you ever get a chance to watch the Penn and Teller show, uh, bullshit, that's what it's called. Uh, they talk about how alien abductions and alien sightings usually correspond with 
shows that have been released, like a movie about aliens. If it was a flying saucer, all of a sudden for a few years, there's claims that they saw a flying saucer. If someone makes a video or a movie about a cube coming down, next thing you know, they're going to have sightings of cubes. It's weird. New Mexico. What is the deal with New Mexico? Believe it or not, that's a very common question I get. Why does New Mexico have about one third the population of Arizona? These two states are very similar in landscape and size. They're right next to each other, and at one point they were actually the same territory. Prior to the 1950s, New Mexico had a larger population. When you look at the history of their census, neither state has had a census where they actually lost population. On paper, they should be very similar. They just aren't. When you look at the population growth, Arizona, since about the 1930s, has been outpacing New Mexico at a pretty good clip. So why can't the land of enchantment bring in folks like Arizona does? To answer that question, we ran a survey where we asked people in New Mexico if they would recommend New Mexico as a good place to live to family and friends. 66% of the respondents said no. They were also asked why they would or wouldn't recommend it, and that's what this video is about, their responses. Got it? Get it? Good. Let's take a look. Number 10. Limited Higher Education Options New Mexico has a small number of colleges and universities. The largest university in the state is the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. They have a small population, so that's part of the reason. They don't need a whole bunch of universities, but it's a giant state. Getting to one is kind of a pain if you live out in the New Mexico outback. Arizona, the state just west of New Mexico, has 53 colleges or universities. New Mexico has 18. They're roughly the same size and area. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the university and colleges in New Mexico. I'm sure they're amazing. I've looked at some of them. They get decent scores. They just don't have enough of them. And colleges and universities draw people in. A lot of people will move to a state either to work for a university or to go to a university. And a lot of times when they're going to that university after they graduate, some of them will stay in the area. I have friends from Las Cusas, New Mexico, and they said their family, and matter of fact, one of them I know, went to the University of Arlington in Texas because they just didn't have enough options in New Mexico. Number nine, poor education scores. Now, besides the universities, you have the K through 12 grades, and they're not knocking it out of the park in New Mexico as far as area vibes is concerned. Now, back in the day when they had a whole bunch of secret government things going on there, they had the highest number of doctorate degrees because all these scientists with their doctorate degrees went and worked on the Manhattan Project and things like that. Now, nothing bad against the teachers and the administrators of the schools in New Mexico. They're just extremely underfunded. New Mexico is ranked 18th in the nation when it comes to per pupil spending, and that's about $10,000 a year. Now, for the area, that's pretty good. They're better than Arizona, Nevada, Utah, Oklahoma, and Texas. But most states are up around 13000 per student, and New York is 24000 Illinois, 16000 Wyoming, 16000 New Jersey is almost 22000 and Washington, D.C. is almost 23000 so they're definitely on the low end of things. Another problem they have is New Mexico is a large rural state, which can make it challenging for schools in remote areas to access resources such as technology, textbooks, and experienced teachers. Additionally, some schools may struggle to recruit and retain qualified educators due to the low pay and difficult working conditions. So they got a lot of hurdles for their education system. Number eight, the climate. The climate isn't great in New Mexico. Uh, really, that can be said for every state, I guess. But New Mexico can be a harsh climate, especially during the summer. And if global warming is everything the experts say it's going to be, it's just going to get worse. One of the biggest bummers about living in an area like this, when it gets really hot and dry, uh, insects, rattlesnakes, black widows, all that good stuff, start heading indoors too. It's not just you looking for that air conditioning. On top of all that, they got a serious drought. New Mexico has experienced drought, which can have a negative impact on the economy and the quality of life, which it has. And just recently, we had all that snow and all that rain on the West Coast. New Mexico got some of it. They just didn't get as much as other states. 
Number seven, lack of transportation. Because of New Mexico's low population and rural areas, there would not be a justifiable way to build and maintain serious public transportation. It's also quite expensive to get started and maintain, which the state doesn't have the funding for. I mean, they underfund their police, their schools, and just about anything else they can because they don't have a lot of income and are not really designed to accommodate public transit. So you'll have to make sure you own a car and pay kind of high car insurance if you move to New Mexico. Yeah, they have one of the highest car insurance rates in the nation. Number six, you better know Spanish. If you want to feel comfortable and blend in, you probably want to learn how to speak Spanish. About 48% of the population of the state is Spanish-speaking residents, which is almost one million people. Knowing and being able to speak Spanish is kind of important, especially if you want to know if people are talking behind your back. Now, is that a necessity? Is that something you need to know before you move to New Mexico? Not really, but it does help. Helps you blend in with a lot of the different communities. Flags of both Spain and Mexico have flown over this state and its history, so Spanish has been a big part of their past and their present. A good percentage of the kids over the age of five speak some Spanish or are fluent in Spanish in New Mexico, regardless of their culture or their race. Number five, they got a high poverty rate. Compared to Arizona, New Mexico's poverty rate's through the roof. Compared to most states, New Mexico's poverty is through the roof. There's only a few states in the nation that have a higher poverty rate than New Mexico, West Virginia, Mississippi, and Louisiana. That's about it. The average poverty rate in New Mexico is 19.6%. That's about 41% higher than the U.S. average. They're also second in the nation with child poverty rate. There's a lot of reasons for poverty rates like this, but you can usually narrow it down to not enough well-paying jobs, low literacy rates, and low quality education. Number four, lack of high-speed internet. This one is becoming less and less a thing every single year with better satellite internet, but a lot of the rural areas of New Mexico have no access to decent internet. And up in the hill areas, satellite internet's not always an option, even if it is SpaceX or whatever. New Mexico is currently ranked 39th among states' internet coverage with speed and availability. Right around 10% of New Mexico's residents aren't able to purchase internet plans that have at least 25 Mbps. That might be enough to work from home, but if you're answering phones and things like that, you need at least 50 Mbps. I'd suggest over 100. Only about 80% of the people in New Mexico have access to 100 Mbps. That ranks them 43rd in the nation. Number three, they got bad roads. Like four years ago, I did a top 10 reasons not to move to New Mexico. And I went off a survey where people listed things they hated about the state. This was one of them. And it hasn't got much better. Almost 25% of the rural roads, they're so bad, they greatly increase the chances of you having an accident. And that's according to the Department of Highway Safety. Now, they have a lot of dirt roads and a lot of just messed up roads. Those don't do good things for your car. And that's part of the reason that auto insurance is so high in New Mexico. There's even a road in New Mexico that's known as the most dangerous road in the United States, or it's also called Devil's Highway. Some experts argue that the roads were poorly designed in New Mexico. Not just the way they're mapped out, the way they're actually designed. It depends on what study you look at, but they're usually in the 40s when it comes to transportation infrastructure. Even their bridges and hilly roads are in poor condition. Number two, low paying jobs. Now, this kind of bleeds into the whole poverty thing, and we kind of touched on it a little bit. New Mexico really doesn't have the best paying jobs. In 2020, the Department of Labor and Statistics came out with the average hourly wage for every state. That's everyone from fast food to pharmacists. So what is the average for your state? Well, there's only a few that had a lower rate than New Mexico. West Virginia at 2088 an hour, Tennessee 2195, South Dakota 2063, Mississippi at 1927, New Mexico is 2221 an hour. You have states like California where it's 29, Colorado 27, Connecticut's 29, Delaware's 26, District of Columbia is $43. 
Hawaii is 27, Massachusetts 31. So they're definitely on the lower end. Luckily for them, the cost of living is pretty low and so are real estate prices. One way to look at it, if you're making $22 an hour in Colorado for something, in New Mexico, it's probably gonna be closer to 17. If you wanna make more money, you can head right over the border to Arizona where it's almost 25 bucks an hour on average. Now, just in case you want to leave a comment and you don't understand, I'm talking the average of hourly wages from minimum wage all the way up to people that are making $50 an hour as some kind of tradesman or something. I'm not saying the minimum wage in New Mexico is $22 an hour. It's actually $12 an hour. And number one, high crime rate. Yep, that's why people don't want to live in New Mexico. They got a high crime rate. It's actually one of the highest in the nation as far as states go. The national average for violent crime is 3.7 for every 1,000 residents. In New Mexico, it's 8.6 for every 1,000 residents. New Mexico is also located along major trafficking routes and addiction is a major problem in this state. All right, so those are the reasons New Mexico has far fewer people than Arizona. Kind of people just don't want to move there for a lot of different reasons. All right, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you got some information out of it. Now go out, have a great day, and be nice to each other. All right, just one state over from New Mexico, we have Nevada. Actually, if you think about it, it's two states. You'd have to go kind of through Arizona. No, I guess you could just Utah. So if you went all the way through Utah, you'd run into Arizona. But if you ran all the way through a few moments later. Today I'm going to tell you why when you take a road trip through Nevada, you'll see more lonely truck stops than you will towns. That's right, the Silver State only has 3 million residents, with almost 70% of them living in one of the state's metro areas. That metro area is Las Vegas, and if it wasn't for Sin City, I am sure Nevada would be the least populated state in the country. There are many reasons Nevada has such a low population, and only a few of them have to do with owing the wrong people some money. Today we look at the 10 reasons Nevada is kind of vacant. Got it? Get it? Good. Let's take a look. Number 10, Mother Nature. Nevada is mostly an arid desert, which makes living conditions harsh and uncomfortable for most people. If you've got a few too many extra pounds and a wool scarf collection you like to wear, even more so. The summer heat in Nevada can be sweltering, with temperatures often exceeding 100 degrees Fahrenheit. On top of that, Nevada is prone to natural disasters such as wildfires, flash floods, and earthquakes. Yeah, it's not just California that gets the earthquakes, Nevada feels them too. They have another natural disaster that's seldom talked about, and I've noticed it, it's grown men crying while they wait to board a flight home. You know, Vegas especially has a lot of homeless people, and I find it amazing that anyone would be homeless in that kind of heat. If I got to live like that, I'm going to do it in the Pacific Northwest where I can get a tent and get out of the rain and cold. Not like you can carry a air conditioner in a backpack or a shopping cart. Number nine, it's dry as a bone. With very little rainfall and next to no surface water, Nevada has limited water resources, which makes it challenging to support a large and still growing population. They are forever in a drought situation. 90% of the state's a freaking desert. This should be expected. And before you do stop typing, I know the Western states have had record rain and snowfall over the last couple months. It's still going on. As I'm recording this, they're about to get hit by another storm. This should ease up the drought for a couple years, I'd say. Lake Mead is fed by the Colorado River, which is the main source of water for the Las Vegas metro area, basically most of southern Nevada. The Colorado River is fed by the Rockies, and the Rockies got record snowfall so far. It's still happening. This will help Lake Mead. It's not going to help it forever. It's not like they're going to have storms like this next year and the following year. It's a desert, and they have too many people taken from the Colorado River. In a year or two, Lake Mead's going to drop back down again. On the northern side of the state, where you got Reno, Lake Tahoe, and a handful of other lakes, they're going through the same thing. Record snowfall, the lakes are filling up, but like Lake Mead, it'll get back down to its normal drought status eventually. Number eight, high cost of living. 
The cost of living in Nevada is relatively high, especially in the urban areas like Las Vegas and Reno. A lot of that has to do with so many people moving to those areas over the last couple decades, I would say, especially Californians. Not just you, Idaho. It's Nevada, Oregon, and everyone else is getting Californians. Californians basically got priced out of their own state, so they start moving to other states, and now those states are getting expensive. It's a cycle that we go through all the time. For decades and decades, California was being filled up with people from other states. That's how they got so expensive. Human beings will move from place to place looking for an easier way to live. Back before we had money, human beings followed the herds and moved to warmer climates during the winter. Now that we don't have to kill woolly mammoths, we follow jobs and cheaper real estate. But because of the migration to Nevada over the last few decades, they've gotten very expensive. Depending on what study you look at, in 2003, Nevada was ranked 23rd with median home listing price. In 2022, they were ranked 14th. Number seven, limited job opportunities. Now, they do have jobs in Nevada. That's a fact. They just don't have a whole bunch of industries. The state's economy is largely based on tourism and gaming, which may not provide enough job opportunities for everyone. The federal government owns a lot of the land in this state, and they have a lot of installations. They have jobs, just they're not that diverse when it comes to the jobs. And this spooks a lot of people. And especially if you're just going off reputation and what you sort of know about Nevada, you think everything's casinos there. They do have other jobs, just not massive amounts in other industries like you'd find in California, Texas, Oregon, Washington, and Colorado. But before you guys complain, listen to the words that I said. They have plenty of jobs, just not a lot of different kinds of jobs on a massive scale. Number six, sparse infrastructure. When it comes to basic services and infrastructure, Nevada ain't got much outside a few major cities. Many parts of Nevada have limited access to public services, including healthcare, education, and transportation. Lack of healthcare infrastructure is a big deal for retirees. For you 20 year olds out there, as you get older, you have to go to the doctor a lot more, and sometimes it includes specialists. And if you're living in the Nevada outback, with a three-hour ride to a hospital, it could get really uncomfortable. Nevada's healthcare is kind of rated poorly, and it's not because they're doing bad work or they have bad hospitals. Accessibility is a big factor when they're grading healthcare, and Nevada doesn't have a lot of access. Great hospitals, great nurses and doctors, staff, all that's terrific, they just don't have enough of it. And it makes sense. They're not gonna throw up a hospital someplace that services 1,200 people in an area the size of Los Angeles County. And like I've said before, infrastructure is not just roads, bridges, and train tracks. Internet accessibility, healthcare, schools, fire stations, hospitals, that's all part of infrastructure. Number five, high crime. Nevada has some crime. Most of it's happening in the Las Vegas metro area, but they have enough there to really make the whole state look bad. Don't get me wrong, other parts of the state do have some crime, but a vast majority of it's gonna be happening around Las Vegas. Go to Vegas for a while, stand around. Seems like everyone's got a scam going on. When I say go to Vegas, you'll see that. Go downtown, go to the Strip, that's where you'll see it. You're not gonna be standing in the parking lot of an elementary school and some guy's gonna try and steal your wallet. Not saying that's never happened. Those first grade teachers got sticky fingers. In 2022, Nevada was ranked fifth in the nation for crime. They had a violent crime rate that was 541 per every 100,000 residents. Their imprisonment rate was 584 adults for every 100,000. That's 13th highest in the nation. Number four, bad reputation. So this one's kind of strange, but a lot of people have misconceptions of what's really going on in Nevada. You have some pearl clutchers out there that just can't get past the fact they have gambling, drinking, hourly company for a price, and strip clubs. Now that's a little unfair to Nevada because there's so much more to this state than just Las Vegas and slot machines. Every state has its stereotype or something everyone thinks about it. And a lot of times it's sort of a delusional stereotype. Once you get out of Vegas, Laughlin and Reno, you're not gonna see giant casinos, maybe down on state line. Most of the state is small out of the way desert towns. It's almost like here in Portland, the rest of Oregon's like another country. Outside of Las Vegas, the rest of Nevada's like another country, totally different. 
Number three, they got a late start. There was really nothing in Nevada prior to the Hoover Dam. Construction started in 1931 and was completed in 1936. And that brought the first large group of people to Nevada. In the early days when settlers were coming west, they really didn't stop in Nevada because the environment was too harsh. Wyoming had the same problem. There were better options in nearby states. Nevada had small towns here or there, but really nothing big. I mean, the Las Vegas metro area had about 5,000 people. Nevada's biggest city in 1930s was Reno, and they had about 18,000 people. Carson City only had 1,500. At that same time, Los Angeles had over a million people, 1.2. Number two, remote location. Nevada is relatively isolated from other major population centers, which may discourage people from living there. And that showed up a lot on the survey. People kept saying how remote it is and how far away it is from everything. And I kind of get it. You look at the map and Nevada is bordered by the eastern part of California, which that's a very sparsely populated part of California. Their second biggest area is Reno, and Reno, again, it's on the border with the eastern side of California, out in the mountains, where we don't have any really big cities out there. In the north, it borders Idaho and Oregon. Idaho has Twin Falls kind of close. That's really not a big city, but it's bordering the part of Oregon where pretty much no one lives. Same goes for Utah to the east. The fact that Nevada has few major highways and airports was brought up a lot too. One thing I did find interesting, almost every major airport in the United States has a direct flight to Las Vegas. But that one was a little bit weird that people kept bringing it up. I mean, I get it, but I don't think it's that big of a deal. And number one. The government owns it. Yeah, that's right. The government owns large portions of Nevada, and that's why you don't have a lot of extra towns springing up. People don't have as many options as you'd think they would to buy land. I mean, you look at a state like Nevada, it's sparsely populated, a lot of open land. You'd think, hey, I could just buy some land, sit on it, whatever you want to do, right? Maybe use it for rabbit hunting, snake hunting, who knows? But the federal government owns about 81% of Nevada's land. Now, when I say owned, I use that loosely. The federal government land is managed for many purposes, such as conservation and development of natural resources, grazing and recreation. But they do own 81.07% of Nevada's total land. That's that's about 56 million acres, almost 57. The state only has 70 million acres. Of that 81.07%, 63% is managed by the Bureau of Land Management, or BLM. We talked about them in a recent video where you could buy a pass for $25 a month. So if you've got a camper and you want to go live out in the middle of the desert, live that van life, you could pay $25 a month and park someplace in the middle of the desert. There's a lot of people out there doing it right now. A friend of mine, Alyssa Vanilla, she has a YouTube channel for that. I'll leave a link down below. She stays on BLM land all the time. But that's another reason not that many people live out in Nevada. They just don't have as much land as you think they might because it's owned by Uncle Sam. All right, let's take a look and see why nobody lives in Montana. This one's a little bit different because it's really about the reasons nobody lives there. And they're not always bad things. A lot of it has to do with how people moved here historically over the early days and how the state grew from the early pioneers and things like that. Let's take a look at Montana. Why doesn't anyone live in Montana? Now, first things first, it's not accurate to say that people don't like living in Montana. A bunch do. Many people are attracted to Montana's natural beauty, outdoor recreation, and a much slower pace of life. Like, it's really slow here. If New York City's lifestyle is fast like a jet fighter, Montana's lifestyle is fast like your grandma in a walker with bunions on a cobblestone road. If you don't know, Montana is a state located in the western region of the USA, known for its stunning natural beauty, vast wilderness, and rugged terrain. Despite its scenic landscapes, Montana has one of the lowest populations in the country. They have just over a million subscribers, ranking them 43rd out of 50. Their population density is ranked 48th. They only have seven people per square mile. There are many reasons for this, ranging from geographical, economic, and social factors. In this video, we'll outline the 10 reasons why Montana has such a low population. Got it? Get it? Good. Let's take a look. 
Number 10, geographical isolation. So this one showed up when we did this same video for Wyoming and Alaska. They're kind of far away from any major cities. I mean, it's one thing if you're a city away from other major cities, that's different. This is a whole state that really doesn't have any major metro areas around them. Now, this creates a few different problems. And one of the biggest ones is bringing in big industries that hire a lot of people. Montana has seen some small tech startups move there, especially in the Billings area in the recent years, but they haven't had a big boom there. If you know anything about Montana, most of the people are perfectly fine with that. My opinion, Montana's like one of those places you shouldn't touch, sort of like the national parks. There's rules against setting up big hotels and things like that on the property. They want to keep it in its pristine condition. Well, Montana's kind of the same way. It'd be nice if we just left it alone. But it's not just the businesses. The isolation makes it difficult for people to access the state and its resources, making it less attractive, possible future residents. Number nine, a harsh climate. Yeah, Montana gets a little rough when it comes to the weather. Montana is sort of known for its extreme weather conditions with cold winters and really hot summers. The state's harsh climate makes it challenging for people to live and work there, which can deter people from actually calling it home. Talked about this when we were talking about Wyoming, that in the early days when people were settling in different areas, these states that had harsher climates and rough terrain were kind of just overlooked or they just passed them by when they were heading out west. They got to Oregon, Washington, or California, even Utah, and the land and the weather was a little more hospitable, and they chose those places over Montana and Wyoming. Now, yes, that was a long time ago, but that slowed the growth of the state. Number eight, limited job opportunities. Montana has a relatively small economy with few job opportunities. If you're looking for a job outside of fast food and retail, you're probably going to have to look in forestry, mining, and different farming, like agricultural things. Become a ranch hand, clean out the stalls, and shower weekly. Number seven, limited access to health care. Montana is a big state. It's actually the fourth largest state in the country, and they have few medical facilities that are available, especially when you look at the rural areas. This limited access to health care can make it difficult for people to receive medical treatment when they need it, which, of course, makes the state less attractive, especially towards older people or anyone with a chronic health issue. A lot of people never put that together. It's hard to move to a rural area when you have some kind of medical condition that requires monthly treatment. You gotta drive five hours to get to a hospital to sit in some kind of machine. I mean, sitting in the machine for an hour sucks. What happens if you gotta drive four hours, five hours to get to that machine? Now, their healthcare isn't bad. Their healthcare professionals do a fine job. But when they rate a state or a city's healthcare, accessibility is one of the main things they factor in. And Montana has far too much land and far too few clinics and hospitals. Number six, lack of diversity. This is one of the things that always gets brought up on these surveys, and it also gets the most comments. Now, why would lack of diversity stop someone from moving to an area? Well, there's a few different reasons. One I always bring up is the food. I like to try different foods, and if, let's say, you don't have a strong Hispanic community, fact is you're not going to find any great mom-and-pop taco places. Same goes for pho or whatever you're looking for. Now, that's just from my point of view. The other point of view is... Sometimes when people move to a new place, they want to see at least some people that are like them. This gives you people that you have more in common with. Doesn't mean you want to exclude yourself from the typical community they have there. But Montana is a predominantly white population with a lack of diversity in terms of race and culture. Number five, rural lifestyle. Montana is rural with small towns and isolated communities scattered throughout the state. This rural lifestyle can make it challenging for people to access resources and services that they may have taken for granted when they live in some urban area. Montana has some cities, but they're not really big cities. Billings is their largest city and it only has about 115,000 residents, followed by Missoula, which has less than 75,000. Great Falls has about 60,000 and Bozeman has just a little over 50,000. Just kind of put that in perspective. If you're not from this country, 
One of the US's largest cities is Los Angeles, and they have a population of just about 4 million residents. And if you look at the entire metro area, it's closer to 13 million. So yeah, Montana doesn't really have a lot to offer when you're looking for cities, but they do have a lot of small rural towns. And if this is something you could live with, it's a great place to call home, but it turns a lot of people off. Number four, limited entertainment and cultural venues. As we just learned, Montana doesn't have a lot of big cities. Big cities come with some negatives, but they also come with some really cool things like a lot of places to see concerts, museums, theaters. They don't have much of that here, and it's just because they've got a small population. If you're one of these people that enjoys stuff like that, Montana might be a hard pass for you. I mean, I'm not a big museum fan, and I don't really care about concert halls or anything like that. I like a good amusement park, and I sometimes like to go to bars that don't play country music in a heavy rotation. But if that's your thing, do it. There's just a lot of people in surveys said that that was one thing that bothered them about Montana. Now, if you're bored, watch the comments of this video. It's a whole bunch of people from Montana that are saying things like, well, we gotta build more museums in if it's keeping them away. Number three, a high cost of living. Montana has a relatively high cost of living compared to other states in this region. The high cost of living can make it difficult for people to afford Montana, especially for those with lower incomes. Now, there's some states that break the standard rule. When you're not on the East or West Coast, you should be cheaper. Montana is a little bit cheaper than let's say California and New York, but not much. It's not Mississippi or Arkansas cheap or even Missouri cheap. One thing I do like about Montana is when you buy property, it's probably be a little more expensive than you'd assume it was going to be, but most of their property comes with like an acre or half an acre or something like that. So if you want to get a good size lot, Montana's probably a good choice. But a lot of people say that the high cost of living really turned them off about Montana. The cost of living in Montana is normally around 6% above the national average. Is that the worst? Absolutely not. Is it terribly expensive in Montana? Not really. But compared to the other states in the immediate area, yeah, it's a little expensive. Number two, limited educational opportunities. Montana doesn't have a whole bunch of giant universities like a lot of other states do. They have limited access to higher education. This limited access to education can make it less attractive to young people looking for opportunities to advance their careers or pursue higher education. In other states, they have some really big, really good universities. Not saying there's anything wrong with Montana's. Their problem is they don't have enough. But a lot of times when kids go to a university, they stay in that area. I would say about half the people I know that moved out of state from my hometown didn't really come home after college and moved to a new state. They basically never came home from college. Whatever state they went to, they stayed there. I know a handful in Arizona, a couple in the Boston area, a whole bunch up here in Oregon, and a few others scattered around the country. Universities do play a big part in growing the population, both in short term and long term. All right, before we get to number one, don't forget we have another channel called On This Day. There's a link for that down below. We'd love it if you went over there and subscribed. All right, on to number one. And number one, public perception. Montana doesn't have the greatest reputation. It's not a bad reputation. They just have this reputation of being kind of vacant, you know, sparsely populated, isolated. And this makes it less attractive to people like we talked about earlier that are coming from cities or more populated states. Now, a lot of people love that about places like Alaska, Montana, Wyoming, but more people would prefer to be around a city. So in conclusion, there are many reasons why Montana has a really low population. They range from geographical, economic factors, social and cultural factors. Now there's nothing really wrong with Montana. It just breaks down to mother nature and it's not everyone's cup of tea, I guess. All right, here's one of the most popular states we have, Idaho. Believe it or not, some people don't want to move to Idaho and a lot of people want to move out of Idaho. Um, they're definitely in the minority. Idaho's a beautiful state. It's got a lot to offer, and people have been moving there for years. There's this strange thing here in Oregon. You run into young girls all the time. Like, I worked with a bunch at Netflix and at Comcast, and they always seem to be from Idaho. They didn't want to live there. Now, a lot of older folks and a lot of people are in their 30s love Idaho. It just seems to be like that 20-year-old to 25-year-old section of the population want to get out of Idaho. Let's take a look.
More people than not would love to live in Idaho these days. It's a very popular state, and it's been that way for a long time now. Hell, it's so popular, we got a bunch of wingnuts that live on the eastern half of Oregon that are trying to split the beaver state down the middle so they could join Idaho. This, of course, will never happen, or at least not in our lifetime. And before you do, stop typing. Yes, Idaho State Legislature just passed a thing where they have the authorization to talk about this plan. But that was sort of done with a smirk and a wink. As in, even they know it's a joke. But that just shows you how popular Idaho is. You got people that don't just want to move there, they actually want to pick up and bring their land with them. But the thing is, like all states, Idaho's not for everyone. 43% of the United States said they would never move to the gym state. And that's fine, we're all different. Like I said in past videos, most people love hot weather, others don't. Some people see life in a small town as slow death, while others dream about it. We're all different. Today's video, we will show you the 10 reasons why 43% percent of the people in the United States would never move to Idaho. Got it? Get it? Good. Let's take a look. Number 10. Things are changing. With popularity comes a lot of change. That's just how things are. Normally when a place gets popular, city, state, town, whatever, prices go up. Cost of living goes up. Housing prices go up. Everything that can go up goes up with a place's popularity. That being said, Idaho, in most cases, is cheaper than a lot of the other states. But for how much longer? Groceries are currently 6% lower than the national average in Idaho. Obviously, it's going to change a little bit when you get into the cities and things like that. But on average, 6% lower than the national average. In 2018, they were 11% lower than the national average. In 2013, they were 13% below the national average. Healthcare expenses usually run near the national average in Idaho. Transportation back in 2018 was about 21% below the national average. That means, you know, everything from maintenance, fuel, car insurance, whatever. Right now, it's 12.5% below the national average. When you look at housing, again, it's hard to get the median price for an entire state because it varies so much between the smaller towns and the cities, but Idaho over the last 10 years has normally been just a little above the national average. Now, a lot of things are changing in real estate across the country, but definitely the housing boom in Idaho's various markets have slowed, so they're kind of still staying above the national average just a little bit. Now, if you know anything about real estate, everything I said just now could change in a matter of a week, so. Number nine, the lowest minimum wage. Idaho is one of 20 states that maintains the federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. Most states have their own minimum wage, but the $7.25 an hour is set up by the federal government to say, you can make it as low as you want, just not below this line. That minimum wage hasn't changed in 10 years. Tipped employees in Idaho only make $3.35 an hour. So if you go to a bar or a restaurant in Idaho, make sure you leave a decent tip. Obviously, everyone's not making minimum wage, but there's enough that are that it's kind of a problem. Idaho has jobs. They have a decent economy, but one of the biggest problems is most of the jobs they have aren't paying that well. And when people aren't getting paid well, a lot of other things start getting worse. Most of the time, it's poverty. Idaho's case, it's getting a little bit higher, but it's still well below the national average. One percentage point, two percentage points below an average on poverty is pretty good. Idaho has a 11.6 for their poverty rate right now, where the U.S. here in the first quarter 2023, it's 12.8. Number eight, the inconvenience. Now, when people were asked why they didn't want to live in Idaho anymore or why they wouldn't move to Idaho, inconvenience came up a lot. And that has to do with shopping, entertainment, healthcare, things like that. Just everything seems to be a little bit further away in Idaho when you compare it to cities and suburbs and other states. Now, this one really isn't that big of a deal and it's something you get used to, but it is something that came up a lot. Other people complain that certain chain restaurants and stores weren't in Idaho. Now, I've seen this one before. I've seen complaints about it. I was actually listening to a radio station in Idaho one time and a few people called in and complained about the lack of different stores that they liked. That really wouldn't bother me, but it bothers a lot of people. Number seven, less educated. This one's weird because there's different ways you could look at it. What's the graduation rate? What are test score rates? What percentage of the kids went on to college? Things like that. But whatever it is, whatever the study, they're usually towards the bottom. 
I don't think it's terrible. They got some good universities and they have some great school districts, but they do show up in a lot of surveys towards the bottom. Matter of fact, U.S. News ranks them 29th in the nation. For higher education, they're ranked 30th in the nation. And when you look at K through 12, they're ranked 23. 23 is not bad. That's a little above the middle. Then you see things like just over 33% of Idahoans over the age of 25 have post-secondary degrees. That same stat in Oregon is 39. Washington, it's 42. California, it's also 42. And I know you're all dying to know, Mississippi, only 25%. Number six, cold weather. Yes, if you don't feel like shoveling snow, stay away from Idaho. The winters in Idaho are pretty harsh, especially if you get up into the mountain regions, obviously. They do get some temperatures that are below zero sometimes, so be aware of that. And this is something I've heard from a few people, including a friend that now lives in Idaho. They get a lot of fog. And in the winter months, you already got pretty bad roads, and then you get the fog on top of it. It could get pretty dangerous. You also run into problems like certain mountain roads are closed during heavy snow, and sometimes it could take them a while to clear it. If you're coming from a city or if you're coming from California, that's totally foreign to you. If you're from Colorado, you're going, yeah, and? But a lot of people said cold winters is what keeps them away from Idaho. Number five, they're not the friendliest. Yes, Idaho is not considered one of the most friendly states. I did a survey about a year and a half ago and did a video of the 10 rudest states. Idaho was ranked 12th. They almost made the top 10. But if you're thinking about moving to Idaho, don't expect to be welcome with open arms. There's a definite desire here to be left alone when it comes to their personal business. The gem state has one of the lowest population density rates in the country. And normally when this happens, they sort of embrace one of those keep to themselves type attitudes. I don't want to say they're a bunch of loners that like to be left alone like preppers, which they do have plenty of preppers out there in Idaho. They just, it's kind of their lifestyle. Now, obviously, if you get into some of the bigger cities and some of these really nice suburbs they have, that's going to be a little bit different. But definitely the small towns, it's a mind your own business type of thing. Now, everything I just said is sort of directed towards outsiders. They're friendly to each other. Just when they don't know you, it's almost like they don't want to get to know you. Number four, it's growing too fast. A lot of people brought up the fact that Idaho has been growing too fast and too many people have been heading there over the last few decades. Some people have the attitude like, I don't know, like you're talking about fashion. Oh, Idaho is so 2010. Well, maybe to some people, but it's still very popular for a lot of other people. And I think the people in Idaho would be more than happy if everyone felt that Idaho was just over and nobody was moving there anymore. They're tired of outsiders. Now, some of the biggest problems you have when a place is growing too fast is like we talked about about earlier the cost of living housing prices go up and after that you start having infrastructure problems infrastructure is not just roads bridges and tunnels schools hospitals as you have an influx of people you gotta build the things to service those people. Schools and hospitals don't just get built in a month. When you constantly have tons of new people moving in, it just takes a lot of time and resources to get things up and running. Now, some of the other infrastructure types, they have like energy infrastructure. They're doing really good there. They're ranked like sixth in the nation, according to US News. But Idaho is ranked 28th in the nation when it comes to internet infrastructure. Now, that one's becoming less of a thing now that they have you know, Starlink and a few other services where you don't need to be connected to the cable company or whatever. And plus now that their new construction slowed down, that might be kind of fixing itself. Number three, it's boring. Yes, a lot of people said it's really boring. Now, normally when I think of a boring state, I'm going to think of Nebraska, Kansas, and Iowa. Idaho doesn't seem like a boring type place, but I like to be outdoors and I like to get into the woods. So to me, it's not boring. But to someone that's coming from someplace like Los Angeles, let's say New York City, San Diego, Dallas, you might move to Idaho and just be all, this place sucks because you're used to that nightlife. Now, they do have a nightlife in Boise and some of the other metro areas they have, but it's nothing compared to... Los Angeles, San Diego, maybe New York City, Atlanta, or Miami type nightlife. And what's strange is that's where a lot of the people moving to Idaho are coming from. Miami, in recent years, has become one of the biggest exporters to Idaho. Obviously, it doesn't rank up there with Los Angeles, San Francisco, basically all of California, but it's moving up the line. But it's moving up the rankings. I mean, it is kind of boring. They don't even have any good violent crimes going on here. A lot of times when I travel different areas, before I go, I like to Google, like, things to do in this town. And something always comes up. There's a few different places in Idaho that I've looked at that there was nothing to do in. It just gave me that, oops, something went wrong sign. I'll say something went wrong. I tried to find some exciting nightlife in Idaho. 
Number two, lack of public transportation. If you don't have a car or motorcycle, you probably want to stay clear of Idaho. Public transportation is pretty much non-existent in this state, unless you're like in Boise or one of the other larger cities. And even the public transportation they have in places like Boise, their reach out into the suburbs is seriously lacking. This is a car dependent state, so you better have a car. If not, you're gonna start losing friends when you call them for rides all the time. There's places in Idaho that don't even have Uber. So if you're one of those people that don't like to own a car, you know, you like to take public transit, you might want to skip Idaho. A lot of people in the survey mentioned this one. Obviously, it's number two. All right, before we get to number one, if you want to help this channel out, they suggest videos at the end of this one, which is one of ours. If you click on that, it really helps the channel, and then I could afford to build McMuffin a new home. All right, on to number one. And number one, they don't want you. Now, this one we kind of touched on when we were talking about how they're kind of unfriendly to outsiders. But the reality is I could have done this whole video on just this one itself. We've also mentioned this one on past videos about Idaho. They don't want you. They don't want any more newcomers. They especially don't want you if you're coming from California. If you are coming from California, keep that to yourself. If you tell them you fell from a Chinese spy balloon, they'll be happier to see you than if you told them you came from California. People have been pouring into Idaho for a good 20 years now. And the locals are just at the end of their rope with the whole thing. Now, it's slowed down a little bit, I'd say, the last three or four years, but it looks like it's picking up steam again. Most of the newcomers leave Washington and California to become residents of Idaho. According to the 2023 American Community Survey one-year estimate, says that right around 17,000 people left California forever and arrived in Idaho looking for a fresh start. Now, 17,000 really doesn't sound like much. I mean, this is a state with almost 2 million residents. But when you think about it, that's 17,000 people from one single state. Sure, it is the state that's given the lion's share of them, but that's every year. It might fluctuate a 1,000 here or there, but for the most part, it's been over 10,000 a year for quite a while. That adds up. One thing leads to another, and the entire state of Idaho is driving Teslas. All right, up next we have... What some people consider one of the worst states, it's got its problems, but I love the people. West Virginia, the mountain state. Let's take a look. A couple months back, we looked at why so many people were moving to this Appalachian state. As soon as that video went up, the comment section went ablaze with people wondering why anyone would move to West Virginia, while a bunch of other people kind of defended West Virginia and said it was a great state. That's the beauty of human beings. We are all different. Most people love hot weather, others don't. Some people see life in a small town as slow death, while others dream about it. So just because we said some nice things about West Virginia in the last video, it doesn't mean the state is for everyone. Myself, I love this state. But to be honest, West Virginia for a long time has been considered the worst state. These days, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Arkansas have flown past them. But like I said in past videos, they've had some really bad luck over the last few decades. The coal industry tanked, the opioid crisis gripped the state tighter than any other state. The list goes on. These days, things are moving in the right direction with the influx of new people like remote workers and retirees. West Virginia may have some problems, but being expensive ain't one of them. And that's why a majority of the new people are relocating here. But that's not what we're looking at today. We're looking at the reasons people won't move to West Virginia. Got it, get it, good. Let's take a look. Number 10, cold winters. Yes, West Virginia being a mountain state gets some pretty cold winters. I think that's something that's often overlooked when people are talking about West Virginia. They always talk about the other things going on there. They never talk about how brutally cold it can get during the winter. Obviously, the temperatures in West Virginia are going to decrease with an increase in altitude, meaning regions such as the Allegheny Mountains and Southern Highland areas experience cooler temperatures than the low-lying areas of the state. This is with everyone. That's not a unique thing to West Virginia. Virginia. In the winter, temperatures range around the low 20s in the cooler mountainous areas in the central and northwest portion of the state. In the warmer southern border, temperatures can hover around 30 degrees in the winter season. That's just kind of the average. It gets much lower. The lowest temperature ever recorded in West Virginia was minus 37 degrees Fahrenheit, and that was in Lewisburg on December 30th, 1917. If you're looking at snowfall, it varies, obviously, depending on what part of the state you're 
you're in, but let's take two examples here. The snowfall in Charleston is around 34 inches annually. When you get up into the Allegheny Highlands, which is in the northern part of the state, sort of, that could get up around 180 inches a year. The good news is it is considered the least tornado prone state east of the Rockies. Number nine, the crime rate. Yep, a lot of people think that the crime rate is really bad in West Virginia. It's not great, but it's definitely not worthy of being a reason to stop you from moving there. Let me explain. Violent crime rate is always the one that stops people from moving someplace. You know, property crime's horrible. You lose some stuff, but you don't lose your life. So everyone's worried about the violent crime numbers. In reality, West Virginia is not that bad. They're ranked 24th in the nation. They have 355 violent crimes for every 100,000 residents. That's not terrible. Arkansas has 671 for every 100,000 residents. Now, on the good side, Maine is always one that has a low violent crime rate. They only see about 108 violent crimes for every 100,000 residents. That's not really cool, Maine. You're making all the other states look really bad. Violent crime is Maine is like an eighth grader pulling some kid's underwear up over the back of his head. What'd they call that back in the day? The atomic wedgie? But yeah, a lot of people complain about the violent crime in West Virginia, and I, it's an illusion. It's really not that bad. Their property crime, yeah, that's a little worse. They're ranked 31st in the nation, which is better than they were in 2016 when they were 44th. Number eight, lack of diversity. This one is a favorite for the comment section, especially for the people that may have had parents that were also cousins. People always want to bring up some bizarre fact about diversity and how it doesn't work and it brings the country down, when in reality, diversity is what made this country. And even in the early days, there was a lot of friction. It just wasn't a black, brown, or white issue. The English and the Germans would have loved to have seen the Irish head back to where they came from. The reality of diversity is more people in the United States enjoy a place with a good amount of diversity over places that have no diversity. And West Virginia is the least diverse state in the country. That's right, West Virginia is the most racially and ethnically homogeneous state in the nation. It could also be homogenous. Those are two different words that mean the same thing. One's just a lot older. Now, the entire state isn't just an episode of Hee Haw. They do have some pockets where you will find some diversity. Charleston, Huntington, places like that. Overall, the state comes up a little short when it comes to diversity. Only 1.6% of the residents are foreign born in West Virginia. Over 90% of those living in West Virginia are white. Now, diversity might not be your thing. I'm not going to judge you. I will make jokes, but I'm not going to judge you. You do you. But most people like to expand their horizons by interacting with other cultures, languages, food. And no, Taco Bell is not diversity. Number seven, it's rural. Now, this is one of the ones that I talk about people are different. Some of you right now are going, there's nothing wrong with rural, while others are going, if I can't go to the club on the weekend, I'm going to have a freaking breakdown. And when you're living rural, you don't get to go to the club every weekend. You end up in some roadside bar where the locals go there so often, they got their own stools at the bar. Just like Norm at Cheers with overalls and fewer teeth. A majority of West Virginia's 1.8 million residents live in communities with fewer than 2,500 people. About two-thirds, or 64%, of West Virginia lives in what is considered rural areas. Number six, limited job opportunities. This is probably one of West Virginia's biggest problems. And that's why West Virginia is laying out the welcome mat for remote workers and retirees. They don't have enough jobs to go around. The last thing they need are people moving into the state looking for a job. So if you show up making $100,000 a year working from home for some company in, let's say, Washington, D.C., you might end up getting the key to the city in Moorfield, West Virginia. Now, West Virginia still does have some mining and logging jobs. It's not what it was in their heyday, but they're still there. But since 2013, the coal production is down about 40%. I honestly think West Virginia should really start focusing on their tourism. There are very few states that are as beautiful as West Virginia with as many things to do outdoors. Camping, hiking, walking around, river rafting, kayaking, zip lining, mountain biking, fishing, hunting. If you want to do it outdoors, West Virginia is probably in your top five best places to do it. Right now, tourism adds about $2.7 billion to the state's economy. And I think that's going to continue to grow. So in the future, I think if you're working in the tourism industry, customer service industry, you might be able to find a good job in West Virginia. These days, jobs are still a little hard to come by.
Number five. Poverty. West Virginia is a state that has always struggled with their poverty rate. They always seem to be neck and neck with Mississippi when it comes to being the poorest state. In 2023, 17.54% of West Virginia's population lives below the poverty line. Put that in comparison, the U.S. average is about 11% right now. There's a bunch of different reasons West Virginia has such a high poverty rate. Obviously, one of them is going to be the coal industry declining. That industry supported this state for for decades. Like I had said, it's dropped 40% since 2013. Another big problem they have is they have a lack of an educated workforce. This normally means a lot of high paying technical jobs don't move into a state that doesn't have a workforce that they need. West Virginia comes in last place when it comes to the percentage of adults with bachelor degree or higher. Number four, they got bad roads and traffic. Now, you wouldn't expect West Virginia to have bad traffic. I saw a lot of complaints about this and people have brought it up. Now, the last two times I went to West Virginia, I saw their traffic and it's different than any other state. Most states have their traffic around the metro areas. West Virginia has it other places. Most of this state is mountainous and a lot of those mountain roads are two lane roads. And if a car breaks down in a lot of different places there or they have a problem with the road, side note, West Virginia has some of the worst infrastructure in the country. The roads are often narrow and winding, which makes it very difficult for drivers to pass other cars. Now they do have passing lanes and all that, but not as many as you'd hope they'd have. There's also a lot of trucks that make the drive even slower, you know, logging trucks, industrial trucks that deal with coal, gas, oil, whatever. They also have a strange amount of accidents. And I think that has to do with obviously the roads and the weather and everything else. Yeah, it's some rough driving in West Virginia. They're a talented bunch when it comes to driving these mountain roads, but still things happen and it slows it down. Number three, government services. This one was brought up a lot in the survey. One man wrote that every government office seems to be half staffed. This obviously plays into why their infrastructure sucks and everything else. A lot of it has to do with tax dollars. They don't have a lot of big industries paying taxes like they did in the past. They don't have a lot of people making a whole bunch of money to give them a good tax revenue. But yeah, a poor economy in a state affects everything, including all the government funding. That's why everything seems to be half staffed, because it probably is. Number two, it's not family friendly. You know, this is another one I don't really agree with. I think it's a great state to raise a family, especially with all the outdoor stuff you could do. They do have some negatives though. Obviously, opportunity for your kids when they get out of school could be a problem. Their schools aren't the best. West Virginia is actually ranked 43rd in education and childcare. And of course, the extreme poverty rate that they have too, that's not great for kids. I mean, poverty is not great for anyone, but especially when you have small children. That being said, West Virginia has the fewest number of young children per capita. I still don't agree with it. I think it's a great place to raise a family. Might want to homeschool them. But it showed up an awful lot on the survey. And number one, poor education. Now, this is one of those things that we've already touched on a little bit, but it deserves its own place, and it showed up an awful lot in the survey. Now, the people I know from West Virginia seem to be pretty smart. I've never had a conversation with one of them and thought to myself, you know what? I wonder what this dude's SATs were. Now, this is how bad it is. West Virginia is ranked 53rd in the nation when it comes to education, making it one of the least educated states in the union. Now, that also counts territories. There's a couple territories stories that did better than West Virginia. They also include Washington, D.C. in that. And like I said earlier, they have the lowest percentage of adults with bachelor degrees or higher in the United States. All right, so in my opinion, West Virginia is a perfectly fine state. I wouldn't mind living there. I've been to Charleston a few times in the last couple of years. I love the people there. I have friends there. Charleston's a nice city. It's a beautiful state. It's just not for everyone. All right. All right, let's finish things off with Tony Soprano's home state, New Jersey. New Jersey is kind of a strange state. It's got a lot going for it, but it's got a lot of negatives. And I always bring up the fact that they had like the most super fun sites. If you don't know what that is, it's when a company, let's say, polluted the soil or the water or lake or something like that. The government has to come in and clean it up. It's called a super fund site. They set aside a bunch of tax dollars called a super fund, and they use that to clean up these places for years. New Jersey had like three times as many as any state, and they're not even one of the bigger states. Let's take a look at New Jersey.
Today, we're gonna to take a look at why so many people are leaving New Jersey. The Garden State is one of those states that has seen more people leave than actually move in. Like most states though, in 2022 and 2023, there's been a bit of a baby boom. So it doesn't seem that bad when you just look at the population growth. New Jersey only dropped about 1% in 2022. The reason it isn't around three or 4% is the birth rate versus the death rate. We're in the middle of the COVID baby boom. When Americans are stuck at home and run out of things to watch on Netflix, it appears they start bumping uglies at a much higher rate. I mean, why not? You don't live together just for the conversation, right? According to a few different studies, for every 10 moves that involve New Jersey, six will leave and only four will move in to the Garden State. So what are the reasons people are flooding out of New Jersey? In this video, we'll explore the reasons most most often given. Got it? Get it? Good. Let's take a look. Number 10, the typical stuff. Now, this one is a bunch of things that show up but really didn't jump out. And they're kind of the typical stuff. People left because of crime, which, I mean, it's not that bad outside of Camden and some of the other cities. That's all. People that don't know New Jersey, that's what they think it is. They think it's just like one big city. Now, they do have some pretty good-sized cities, especially up near New York City, like Newark, Hackensack, Edison. Then down on the Delaware River, you have Trenton. And then even further southwest, you have Camden, which is right across from Philadelphia. Camden's a nightmare, but most of the city is pretty decent. So I think all the people that listed crime are probably coming out of Camden, Trenton, someplace like that. They also listed lifestyle, which is people that just want to change a pace and the other people wanted to change a scenery. Maybe they moved to the desert. Maybe they moved to the mountains of Colorado or Virginia, something like that. And of course, family and politics showed up. None of these were enough to be their own place on this list. So I just threw them in there as a collage of reasons. One interesting fact I did find was when they asked people of different political parties, 69% of Republicans said they wanted to move compared to only 47% of Democrats said they wanted to move. Also, like I said, people listed family and that's usually they just want to move closer to family. Maybe the kids moved out of state. They got grandkids. So, you know, the grandparents move to be closer to the grandkids and their own kids, stuff like that. Number nine, health reasons. Health reasons is normally, this one could almost be lumped in with one that's later on on the list, but health reasons usually mean they want to move to a warmer climate. Maybe they're getting older, the arthritis, things like that. Maybe lung problems because New Jersey doesn't have the best air quality, especially around the cities, obviously. Now, New Jersey does have some incredible hospitals, so it's not like a lot of people are leaving because they can't get a good neurosurgeon or something like that. They can get all that in New Jersey and they're right across from New York. I think it has more to do with the air quality and want to move to a warmer climate. Number eight, traffic and crowds. Obviously, this is another one that made it onto the list because of the cities, especially around New York City. If you don't know, just like so many other states where they share a border and there's two big cities next to each other, they're kind of the same metro area. Well, Newark, Hackensack, Jersey City, they're really all kind of the New York City metro area. And if you don't know about the crowds there, it's pretty bad, especially the traffic can get insane. Luckily, they've had decades and decades to work on their traffic system and their public transit. It could be so much worse. But yeah, crowds and traffic is what a lot of people leaving New Jersey listed as why they're leaving. Number seven, the taxes. Yes, this is a big one for people in New Jersey. They are the most taxed state in the country. Many of the middle class are the ones that are getting hit the worst, especially when it comes to property tax. The median property tax in New Jersey, and this could change, so don't you know, give me a hard time if you watch this a year down the line. These are 2022 numbers, but the median property tax rate is about $2,400 for every $100,000 on your home. So if you've got a $500,000 home, roughly you're going to be paying about $12,000 in property tax every year. That is the highest rate in the country. On top of that, you got a lot of sales tax and income tax. Both are about average for the rest of the country. But when you stack that up with the highest property tax in the United States, it's pretty rough. Rough. A lot of people in New Jersey just feel they're being taxed to death. Number six, jobs. Now, a lot of people move from every state because of jobs. And when you have different things like high taxes, traffic, crime, and an unfavorable lifestyle, it makes it easier to choose a new state if offered a job there. 
with states like New Jersey and California and New York are seeing this also. It's very expensive. So a lot of companies in other states are offering jobs to these people and they look and go, you know what? I'm getting paid about the same, but my taxes are lower. Like Kansas has less of the stuff I hate. Why not move there? That's what's been drawing people to Nevada for so long from California. It's like, look, we don't have half the crime, half the crowds, and it's half the expenses. Why not come to Nevada and work? I think it's slowed down now, but for many years, people are just flooding out of Los Angeles for the Las Vegas metro area. That's sort of what's happening in New Jersey. The grass is always greener on the other side of the septic tank, you know? There's three main states that are luring a lot of New Jersey residents away. Iowa, Utah, and Idaho. It's like people in New Jersey have just given up on the eastern seaboard. Number five, education. A major reason people are leaving New Jersey is they want to attend a college in a different state. In the last five years, New Jersey has been one of America's top exporters of college students. I find that one a little strange, but this is a very common thing in New Jersey. A lot of states don't have nearly as high a rate, especially like Wisconsin. Almost 70% of the students that leave high school for college in Wisconsin will stay in Wisconsin. Only about 45% of high school students in New Jersey choose to attend college in New Jersey. But it is kind of strange. New Jersey has some top-rate schools. Rutgers is phenomenal. Seton Hall is good. They even got an Ivy League college. Yale is in New Jersey. Stop typing. It's actually Princeton. Yale's actually in New Haven, Connecticut. How many of you were leaving the comment? But that one does surprise me a little bit because they do have some great universities and colleges in New Jersey. I don't know why someone wouldn't just pick one of those. Maybe just because it's New Jersey. Number four, the weather. Yeah, the weather in New Jersey kind of sucks, mostly in the winter. Summers aren't terrible, it gets a little warm, and in the rural areas, it does get pretty humid, but not like, you know, deep south humid. We're not talking humidity like Mississippi, where you got mosquitoes that fly off with your children. Because of the weather, you find a lot of people moving out west to Arizona, maybe New Mexico, Texas, California, Nevada, Utah, and they also go down to Florida quite often. New Jersey is actually the second highest exporter of snow birds to Florida. Like I've mentioned in a lot of other videos recently, a lot of people are choosing South Carolina over Florida in the last handful of years. Which, I mean, if I was a southern state, I would be doing everything I could to get retirees in. Most retirees that move have an income coming in, whether it's through a pension, retirement plan, or just social security. So when they move someplace, they don't take up a job that maybe a Florida or South Carolina or whatever state's resident may be doing. They're just bringing their money down and buying things and being part of the community. That's a win-win. Sort of like for the remote workers. If I was running a state, I would do everything I could to get remote workers in. One of the biggest problems any state faces is jobs for all the residents. If you're moving to my state, you're bringing a job with you and you're paying taxes, you're like gold. If I was like the mayor of Iowa, it's like day one, I would build the internet infrastructure and make sure we had the fastest internet in the country. And then I would start running ads to people in New York City, New Jersey, California, about how you could come here, get free internet maybe, and work from home. Yeah, I'd give uh, remote workers free internet. Just move to the state and pay your taxes. But back to the weather. This is one of the major things that people listed on why they're moving out of New Jersey. Snow can get pretty thick in New Jersey, and if you've ever had had to shovel snow a couple winters in a row, you kind of start looking for warmer climates. When it's not snowing in the winter, of course, you got the cold and dreary weather and this, you know, affects people's attitude and their emotions and their mental well-being. Number three, cost of living. New Jersey has a high cost of living throughout the state. The cities obviously are going to be higher, but the state pretty much is a pay to stay type state. Depending on the study, New Jersey has anywhere between the 12th and the 7th highest cost of living in the country. If you were to compare them to the state with the lowest cost of living, which is Mississippi, overall New Jersey is estimated to be about 49.9% more expensive than Mississippi. To give you an idea what that looks like, if you go to a restaurant and take your whole family and it costs $100 in Mississippi, it's $125 in New Jersey. Groceries are about 30% higher. Child services are only about 2.4 times higher than Mississippi. Now, Mississippi is just the extreme lowest. I'm just trying to give you an idea how high they are compared to the lowest. 
Number two, housing costs. New Jersey is ranked 13th in the nation when it comes to housing costs. The median home price in 2022 was $424,000. In New Jersey, it was $455,000. At the same time, the average rent price in the United States was about $900, while in New Jersey, it was $1,369. Now, that's what they call the median, and that's kind of the middle, and it's something that just economists and real estate agents look at. The average person wants to know what the average price is. Now, it's sort of hard to nail it down for an entire state. Cities are much easier, but the average home is sold in New Jersey for about $520,000, 2022. At the same time, the average rent is in between $22 and $2,800. The average home price at that same time for the United States is about $100,000 less, and rent is about $1,000 less. Now, on top of that, you just feed into the fact that they have that incredibly high property tax. It's just ugly to buy a home or rent in New Jersey. And number one, retirement. Yep, that's right. People are retiring outside of New Jersey. Of course, you got the snowbirds that once they retire, they just put New Jersey in their rearview mirror and they head to South Carolina, Arizona, or Florida. About two thirds of the people leaving New Jersey were 55 years and older. Now, a lot of the reasons we already mentioned play into this. Higher cost of living drives retirees out of a state. Higher housing costs drive retirees out of the state. Cold weather drives retirees out of the state. And families also also send retirees packing. Health reasons also send retirees out of state. I mean, nobody wants to shovel snow with a bad back in a house that's far too expensive for their fixed income. Am I right or am I right? But like I had mentioned earlier, a lot of retirees are choosing other states than Florida. Florida's always been the go-to one. It is still the most popular, but you're starting to see more going to South Carolina, like I'd said, Utah, Arizona, and Idaho. Maybe Idaho will quit complaining about Californians and start complaining about New Jersey residents. All right, that's today's video. If you guys haven't subscribed, please do so and give this video a big thumbs up. I really appreciate it. Everybody have a great day. Be nice to each other. All right, that's today's video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you got some information out of it. Now go out, have a great day. Be nice to each other.